Turning now to a newsroom made for our times. The 19th is a non-profit website that covers gender, politics, and policy. It's named after the 19th Amendment, which gave American women the vote in 1920, at least most of them. From childcare to jobs to voter suppression, it covers issues that are pivotal to everybody, especially women of color and LGBT community. Here is the CEO and co-founder, Emily Ramshaw, talking to our Hari Srinivasan about the project amid a pandemic that's hitting women so hard. Christian, thanks. Emily Ramshaw, thanks for joining us. One of the first big stories that you came out with uh, was called the She Session, in a way, in that right around the time that the pandemic was coming in, people had anecdotal stories of how this was disproportionately affecting women, but your site was one of the first places to really dive deep in on this. And sadly, we are nowhere close to evening that out or improving that situation. It has still continued throughout the pandemic. Absolutely. I mean, this is truly like the first women-specific recession in American history. And, you know, we can go through what some of those numbers look like, but the reality is women were the ones who held the majority of jobs that were lost in this pandemic. Women also were the ones disproportionately affected by the immediate erosion of childcare and access to, to in-school education. Um, and so as a result, uh, women, and in particular women of color, have been hit in an extraordinary way. I mean, I think there are a lot of folks who believe it's going to take a generation for women to get back on track with the losses that we've seen. And it took a generation even just to get up to this point and how fast some of those gains have been given back if you're talking about so many women having to choose between continuing a job or trying to provide childcare at home. Absolutely. I mean, if you if you think about the height of this pandemic, so, you know, back in the spring, uh, there were 12 million women who had lost their jobs. You know, we, ha we have not even recovered half of those jobs at this point. If you look at the most recent jobs report in December, I mean, the numbers are still really harrowing. Um, you know, we just have not made the strides back. I think, you know, among Latina women, 9% uh, are unemployed. I mean, these numbers are sky high. And in this moment where we've seen this renewed resurgence, numbers are almost as bad as they were, you know, several months ago. So this this is a harrowing, a harrowing moment. Is this because of the roles that women are playing in the workforce today? I mean, when you look at particular professions, say for uh, in classrooms or in nursing as a profession, probably three out of four of either of those occupations are women. But why is it so disproportionate that so many women are losing their jobs? Right. You know, when you look at the industries that have been hardest hit, uh, those those industries tend to be powered by women. So whether it's the service sector, which is powered by women, uh, you know, whether it's education, jobs in education and childcare, which have been supremely hard hit, you've seen enormous job losses in these arenas. You know, you've also had women at the front lines, by the way, of you know, uh, healthcare, uh, nursing. So you know, whether they are losing their jobs on one end or sort of uh, thrown headfirst into the fire on the other end, they've been hit super hard. But I think the flip side of this is we all know that women still overwhelmingly bear the burden of both child care and elder care, that sandwich generation of trying to care for your child and keep your parents alive. And, uh, you know, this is thrown all that into full relief in this moment in history. But as you have seen, you know, kids home from school in enormous numbers, as you've seen, you know, child care centers, I think there's some, I saw some statistics that like half of child care workers have been laid off during the pandemic. That means that, that parents and in particular mothers have been left to make this really difficult choice, you know, do I stay in the workforce or do I have to stay home and care for my child? And so many, so many are having to leave the workforce. And I don't know if it's our willful ignorance of this, but there are so many more people aware of how important childcare is to the functioning of an entire economy. Like right now, we have policymakers thinking about, okay, we need to get children back into school because guess what? If the kids aren't in school, the parents aren't going to be productive, they can't go to work, et cetera, et cetera. But it's sad that it took a pandemic to make us realize the importance of this function in society. Yep, you know, I would say women have been talking about this for a very long time, and you know, folks at the highest levels of government just haven't been listening. But the reality is, other countries are far ahead of the United States when it comes to things like paid leave. The United States is the only country, you know, in the free world where there is no semblance of assured paid leave. Um, you know, I think childcare, certainly uh, affordable childcare, access to childcare has been an enormous problem for years. Childcare deserts are a supremely uh, giant problem. The cost of childcare 
you talk to any parent, so many women drop out of the workforce because it's more expensive to keep their child in childcare than it is to care for them at home. They can't make up the difference in their careers. And so th this has been a problem for, for, for generations, for decades, certainly. And it has taken this pandemic, I think, really to throw it into, into full relief and front and center in the public eye. It's hard enough to get a new website or publication launched, but then to do it at the beginning of a pandemic, you just kind of really seemed like you wanted to up the odds against your success here. That seems to be an incredible undertaking. Tell me a little bit about what it's like to start a new site, go out and fundraise, go out and uh, hire the staff, do everything right around the time when corporate underwriting could disappear to nothing. Some of your funders might be hesitant. I will tell you, this has been the hardest year of my life, certainly, and, and many others. Uh, but I think uh, if you had told me a year ago that I would be launching a, a startup uh, focused on gender, politics, and policy in the middle of a global pandemic, in the middle of a, a racial reckoning, hopefully a modern day civil rights movement, uh, you know, I'm not sure I would have taken that giant risk. Uh, the reality is, you know, there were uh, there were a lot of tearful moments at the dining room table trying to figure out if we were going to even make this uh, uh, make this happen. But we realized pretty quickly even as our fundraising was drying up in the winter, that this was a moment that was going to disproportionately affect women and other marginalized people, particularly women of color, and that we had a moral obligation, honestly, to jump in head first. So we're a year in, you know, amazingly, we have hundreds of thousands of people reading our site every month, tens of thousands of people subscribing to our newsletter, more than 200,000 people have come to our events, um, and, you know, 10,000 early members who are, are making this a reality for us. So, uh, yes, it has been really hard, but this moment in history feels so critical, and we are so uh, grateful that we've been able to launch the 19th in this particular year. Why did you need to exist, given all the publications that exist today? Why is there not the type of focus that you are bringing to it? Sure. I mean, look, the reality is, and, and you know this well, I mean, I think the, the majority of American newsrooms in the politics and policy sphere are, they're overwhelmingly uh, run by uh, men, white men. Um, you know, you see that at the reporting level, you see that at the managerial level. And I think a lot of reason that you have seen that is that that uh, women opt out of this industry at a particular point because the salaries aren't high enough, the benefits aren't good enough, and the childcare uh, reality is, you know, the news cycle is not conducive to trying to have small kids at home. I mean, we all know that. I experienced that firsthand. I've got a five-year-old. Um, and so our vision was to see if we could create um, a, both an atmosphere where we could change the national narrative around gender, politics, and policy, around how women are presented in the news uh, by building a newsroom that was truly representative of, of the nation's women and the LGBTQ community. So that's what we've worked to do uh, this last year. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of, of where we are today. What kinds of steps did you take to make sure that the environment that you were creating and building from scratch was not only more productive, but uh, also more rewarding and more humane? We started with offering the kind of benefits that none of us had seen in any other newsrooms in America. So, you know, from the ground floor, when we were fundraising to build this. We built this into our brand and our value proposition and our budgets. Six months of fully paid family leave for all new parents four months of fully paid caregiver leave so you would not be penalized for spending the last several months of your mom or dad's life at their bedside. Um, you know, 100% coverage of healthcare premiums, a 401k match, and the ability, honestly, to work completely remotely. This was pre-COVID, uh, to work wherever you have the best child care and elder care setups. I mean, my vision is, you know, can we advance more women into news leadership, and in particular, more women of color into news leadership by giving them the support systems they need at that that sort of critical sandwich generation moment in their lives uh, to get past that. I mean, I am, I'm the child of two journalists, right? My mom was in middle to upper management uh, as a journalist uh, in my sort of, you know, formative years. And the days were long. I mean, you, you know as well as anybody else what political journalism is like. You know, the need to have uh, your body in the chair, in a newsroom, in a desk, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, that's really, really tough uh, when you're trying to balance family, when you're trying to care take care of elderly relatives. So all of those things were big priorities for us. And certainly they came into full relief during the pandemic when we had folks 
needing to take advantage of those leave policies, when we had colleagues whose parents, you know, uh, died of COVID, when uh, many of us were stuck with small children at home, um, you know, if we prove that we can launch a startup like this in a pandemic with those kinds of benefits, I think those kinds of benefits are feasible and should be instituted everywhere. In a way, your staff ended up contributing through their own lives and the lives of their peers to the exact type of stories you're talking about. The challenges that they're facing in their real lives are the ones that you're helping kind of distribute to a wider audience about what's happening. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one other element of that is, you know, we're talking about the pandemic here, but we also have had, again, a, a moment of racial uh, reckoning in this country, the, a summer that was um, uh, sparked a whole lot of really critical conversations. And we're also a newsroom where we encourage our colleagues to bring their full lived experiences into the workplace. And so, you know, uh, Aaron Haynes on our team was the, the first national reporter to tell the, the Breonna Taylor story. And, you know, obviously that was a, a, a landmark moment and a really important story for, for this nation. Um, we've, we've had a lot of moments like that where we're um, really devoted to ensuring that we're telling the full story. And, and by the way, having a newsroom that is fully independent and says there are also things we stand for. We stand for gender equity. We stand for racial equity. We stand for human rights. Why do you think the Taylor family uh, chose to tell her story to your publication? I know why they chose to tell the story to our publication and said they thought that the stories of, of black men who were wrongfully killed by police uh, were getting more attention in the national media than the stories of women who were being wrongfully killed by police. And so they came to us and their lawyer came to us uh, with that particular lens in mind. Uh, and I think they were right on that count. You know, uh, that story got picked up far and wide. Uh, it, you know, I think in many ways, uh, Breonna Taylor's case reignited the Say Her Name movement. It became a, a, a flashpoint in this just really critical moment in history. And, and they came to us with that gender lens front and center. What do you think the Biden administration has to do? How quickly do they need to move in order to uh, hear the concerns of so many uh, women and people of color who voted for the Biden administration, who think that family leave is important, who think that child care is important. What, what kinds of steps does the administration have to take? You know, I think there are going to be a lot of people who are looking to hold his administration accountable because, you know, they have been uh, very adamant, very clear in their demands and what is needed in this moment in history. And so I think, you know, you've already seen it. If this uh, if this rescue plan of Biden's comes to be, you know, you'll see uh, conversations around increasing the minimum wage, which would disproportionately affect women who are in those low wage jobs, you know, um, bolstering child care, you know, instituting uh, expanded paid leave, um, you know, providing rent relief. Uh, so many of those things, uh, you know, directly affect women and hit women of color hardest of all. And so I do think you're going to see um, a lot of a, a lot of demands, a lot of attention spent in these particular areas, and a lot of uh, really high expectations uh, that, given his his potential in this moment, with both chambers of Congress and also with um, executive orders, that he can take pretty serious and swift action. Have you spoken to members of the administration or the comms team, so to speak? I mean, they are primarily women led and you have the Biden administration can already say, look, look at the number of female nominees for cabinet positions. That's uh, a, certainly a, a massive reversal from what it was in the last four years. Um, how do you make sure that it's not just a numerical checklist and make sure that uh, the voices of these women and people of color are uh, represented, represented in the administration in a more forceful way? Yeah, so I, we've been really front and center in reporting on and sort of providing, I think, a level of accountability for, you know, okay, this is what you said you're going to do. Who are these people who are in the administration and, and what are their roles? Uh, we had a, a live uh, event a couple of weeks ago where we interviewed the four women who are leading the Biden-Harris comms team. It was a fascinating conversation just to hear from them, both from the standpoint of, of the work that they're intending to do and how they're trying to build uh, rebuild trust with the American public uh, to, you know, what it's like being women in these particular roles and particularly how having, you know, small kids. Uh, and so that was a fascinating conversation that if, if your viewers haven't seen it, I'd encourage them to. Uh, you know, I think the the um, people who are on the really uh, front end of um, uh, Biden's healthcare initiatives, many of them are women. You know, many of the top uh, officials who are nominated are women. Um, you know, uh, the deputy health director who he's nominated is, would be, the, the I believe, the first transgender uh, official uh, in, in uh, these appointed offices. And so, 
we're keeping a very close eye on those conversations, but this isn't just about having women in uh, appointed positions in an administration. It's about normalizing it. <laughs> it's about making sure you're not just asking the questions about, you know, what's it like to be a woman in this particular role, but, uh, but normalizing that leadership and asking them the same tough questions and accountability driven questions th that you would ask a man in that role. One of the things we've also seen during this time is the effect of misinformation and disinformation. And we can see as it comes to vaccine rollouts, for example, there is still a pretty massive inequity in terms of who's getting the vaccines and also who has access to good information about the vaccines to make up their own minds. Um, well, what kinds of things are you doing as a newsroom or as reporters? What kind of story ideas are you talking about around this? Absolutely. So I think, you know, one other thing in this arena that's really important to recognize is that women tend to be the ones who are making medical decisions, healthcare decisions for their households and their families. And, and women are also subject to really specific misinformation, disinformation. I mean, we've written a lot about the different ways that, that women can fall prey to this misinformation, even in places like Pinterest. Uh, and so uh, we're focusing pretty seriously on telling the stories of, of women at the forefront of vaccine research, of people who are doing the work to target misinformation. Um, we're going to be uh, hosting a, a really specific symposium uh, aimed at uh, women and misinformation and how we sort of battle that uh, as a nation. So I think we're paying very close attention to, uh, to that line of storytelling and also specifically the ways that um, communities of color may not be getting the full story uh, or are you know, concerned about, about vaccine science and the, the ways that they have been marginalized uh, in healthcare in the past. Uh, you know, we're we're talking to folks about the way that uh, that the Latinx community has been uh, targeted for misinformation in Spanish. So lots of conversations. Again, you know, for us, the asterisk is about people who have been left out of our democracy, and this is a moment when, candidly, we can't afford for anyone to be left out. But where is that gap in terms of people being left out? How far have we come? How far do we have yet to go? Look, I mean, it's interesting when we think about the, the 19th itself, you know, we're named for the 19th Amendment. But the reality is the 19th Amendment gave white women the right to vote. And it was another four decades well into the civil rights movement before uh, any women of color had uh, access to the vote. And even then, uh, you know, from then basically to the present day, we continue to see voter suppression that has hit communities of color hardest. Uh, you know, we also uh, write a lot about the the um, gaps that have kept uh, trans Americans from getting access to the polls, uh, issues around, you know, uh, IDs uh, and, you know, uh, making sure that you're you're able to access the polls with your true name uh, and your identity. And so I think this is all a work in progress. This asterisk in our logo, which is the center of the, what the 19th does is, you know, democracy still is only available for some of us. And, and we need to work really darn hard, and in particular in this moment in history, to ensure uh, that we're leveling that playing field and bringing more people to the table. Emily Ranshaw of the 19th, thanks so much for joining us. So happy to be here.